Hello students, welcome to Chapter 1, Lecture 2, Part 2. We also need to be able to identify unusual findings on radiographs. Let's take a look at the upper left radiograph. This little line here appears to be possibly a broken instrument. Um, could be some other kind of sharp object. It turned out to be an amalgam, a piece of amalgam. If they had noted clinically, that should have had an amalgam tattoo showing on the tissue. So the combination of clinical and radiographic diagnosis is really useful for diagnosing amalgam tattoos. Now, one of the most common emergencies that happens in a dental office is a broken instrument. Over here, you can see, noted by the white arrow, that, that is a broken hygiene instrument. The picture on the upper right-hand side shows a very obvious amalgam overhang. An amalgam overhang is created when the bands that are placed around the tooth to help shape the amalgam is not properly placed and the amalgam leaks out underneath the border. The rough edges and poor adaptation can lead to further disease and decay including periodontal disease in the areas where the amalgam impinges on tissue and also more decay in the areas where the tooth is not properly sealed. The next radiograph shows something very unusual. The arrow, the black arrow is pointing to it. It looks like it could be a strange sort of tooth, some uh, kind of artifact caused by improper placement of a thyroid collar perhaps. It could be just about anything. Therefore, a clinical diagnosis needs to be done, and it was discovered that this was part of the person's very large pair of glasses that were not removed when taking radiographs. So it was a radiographic error. The picture on the top left shows a radiopaque circular area, which turns out to be a nose ring. The next image shows a very strange appearance here. We are actually looking at the occlusal surface of a retained deciduous tooth that instead of falling out, tipped over on its side and now is at 90 degree angle to the occlusal plane. Here is what appears to be uh, an MO amalgam that was placed on it and that tooth uh, crown, the residual crown needs to be removed. Radiographs can also show up radio opacities that can be shotgun pellets, pieces of shrapnel, other kinds of metallic objects that may be embedded either in the bone or the surrounding soft tissue. Historical diagnoses are obtained by getting a personal history, a family history, past and present medical and dental histories, history of drug ingestion or drug use, and of course the history and duration of the presenting disease or lesion. Family histories can pinpoint the diagnosis of amelogenesis imperfecta, which is improper maturation and formation of the enamel, or dentinogenesis imperfecta, which is the improper maturation and formation of dentin. A historical diagnosis needs to include medical or dental status of the patient. You need to include medical conditions such as ulcerative colitis, drug histories such as calcium channel blockers, allergic reactions, history of surgical procedures that could help explain any of the findings that you note during a clinical exam. 
In some cases, either clinical or radiographic findings may require further laboratory testing in order to come up with a definitive diagnosis. Laboratory diagnosis includes blood chemistries, urinalysis, and cultures. In this image, it shows the radiographic appearance known as the cotton wool effect, and the patient also had an elevated serum alkaline phosphate level. Therefore, they came up with the diagnosis of Paget's disease of bone. Biopsies are necessary for making a microscopic diagnosis. Often the main component of the definitive diagnosis is microscopic. In order to get a good diagnosis, however, adequate tissue sample is necessary and a sample that does not include margins may not be adequate. Brush biopsies have become very popular of late. This is a circular brush which is used to obtain cells from the full thickness of epithelium without cutting into it. The results of this test may help determine whether a scalpel biopsy is needed to establish a definitive diagnosis. However, the majority of the biopsies come back as uncharacteristic and do still require a scalpel biopsy and sometimes it could just be a waste of money for the patient. A white lesion that cannot be diagnosed on the basis of clinical appearance alone will require microscopic diagnosis. The microscopic appearance can vary from a simple thickening of the epithelium to epithelial dysplasia, which can prove to be premalignant. Surgical diagnosis involves gaining surgical access to the area of the lesion. The diagnosis is made using the information gained during the surgical procedure. As an example, a traumatic bone cyst may appear as a radiolucency that scallops around the roots. When the lesion is opened surgically, an empty void is found. Another example of surgical diagnosis is in the case of this radiolucent lesion pointed to by the white arrow on the radiographic image at the bottom of the slide. This is actually a lingual mandibular bone concavity. It's also known as a static bone cyst or Staphne's bone cyst. Surgical examination of the well-circumscribed radiolucent area reveals salivary gland tissue entrapped during development. Therapeutic diagnoses are achieved by either supplying nutritional supplements or by using medication to see if the condition clears up. The condition on the lip commissure seen below is known as angular chylitis, which may be associated with deficiency of B-complex vitamins or a fungal infection. Necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, also known as NUG, can respond to hydrogen peroxide. Differential diagnosis is that point in the diagnostic process when the practitioner decides which test or procedure is required to rule out the conditions originally suspected and to establish the definitive or final diagnosis. The differential diagnosis can include a list of different ailments that can be suspected. The definitive or final diagnosis only has one. Most states do not allow hygienists to diagnose disease. So what is the hygienist role in differential diagnosis? The hygienist sees the patient far more frequently than the average dentist because patients come in for maintenance treatments more frequently than they do for evaluations or for treatment of disease. So the hygienist role is crucial in providing an accurate differential diagnosis and helping the patient. The important points are to be observant. Make sure you look, feel, touch, ask as many questions and 
as are necessary when collecting data. Make sure you have thorough patient medical and dental health histories. Make sure that you know the history of the lesion. Make sure that the clinical description and evaluation are accurate and thorough. Make sure that biopsy and microscopy reports are included in the patient's charts. Ensure that your clinical notes are neat and legible. Make sure that you notify the dentist in case of any changes in the size, shape, or color of any lesion that has been being followed by the office. The dentist and hygienist are the only two licensed health professionals in a dental office. Therefore, make sure that you take that responsibility seriously and take care of your patient. This concludes Lecture 2. Please see Lecture 3 for Chapter 1 next.